option. And you're you're good to go. Awesome. So welcome everyone. Uh, so I kind of just introduced myself before, not sure if everyone was in the room, but my name is Katiri. I'm the APS garden specialist um, on Tiwa lands. Um, pronouns are she, her. Um, I am uh, going to start off this, kick off this presentation we have for you on School Gardens 101. Uh, let me do you present. Okay. So um, I just wanted to start off with seeing who's in the room. That's one of the beautiful things about um, school gardens, you know, is like we not we honor the knowledge that's in the room already. Um, so I uh, wanted to um, give everyone a chance to share in the chat uh, your dreams of school gardens. So when you think school garden, um, what do you think of? You know, it could be one word, two words, three words, whatever you want. Um, but just go ahead and, and start sharing those dreams in the chat and I can kind of uh, shout them out as they come. Here are some ideas um, I put up already to kind of get us going. Um, of course, you know, school gardens are a place to grow food. Um, uh, they're also a place to learn and connect, a place to reimagine our schools and our cities. You know, a lot of students I talk to are like, man, my school looks like like a prison, you know, there's all this concrete and stuff and, and they come come to, to me with some beautiful dreams about how to start gardens at their schools and stuff. Um, so beautiful place to reimagine um, what our schools look like, what our cities look like. Um, definitely a place for intergenerational learning. Um, that's one thing I love is like in school, we're all split up, right? We're all in these different age groups and um, in the garden, like, it's such a beautiful thing when you have an elder there to teach you and share with you um, their experience and knowledge um, in the garden or um, having older students, you know, um, working with younger students. Uh, it's just a really, really great place to um, do that. Then we have, let me see what we got in the chat here so far. Relax and recenter. Yeah, Susan. Just over there with Susan planting with the students, definitely relaxing, just weeding together. Um, let's see, Zuli from uh, Service Food Pour says sustainability and nutritious food. Heck yeah. Um, we've got happy kids engrossed in, fast, in a fascinating movement from Misa Patterson, NMSU. Um, Jesus, outdoor classrooms. Is that the Jesus I know? Not sure outdoor classrooms for sure. Active healthy learning, right on Randy. Uh, what else we got? Oh, Jesus from La Semilla, welcome. A student I work with named Jesus, so I didn't know if he was joining today. Hope for the future, community building and love, awesome. So uh, yeah, definitely a place for, um, you know, uh, sharing in circle. Uh, and building community, um, not only a place for growing food, but also a place to celebrate, you know, poetry, music, art, um, all of these things. We've had, we've had a couple schools put up some really beautiful murals in the garden um, and that be a part of the, the learning there. Um, and then we have uh, career and technical stuff, you know, we've got people doing um, real jobs and stuff like that. So <laughs> that's what this is all about. So moving on, um, I just wanted to just share with you a few things really, really quickly, uh, what I want you to know about school gardens. And the main thing is that you belong to a collective. Um, I go to a lot of gardens and people are just trying to do it by themselves. And, you know, they kind of think they're all alone, but you guys aren't alone. Like you're a part of this beautiful collective of people. Uh, we have 93 gardens across the district. Um, and so, uh, I really want you to feel a part of that and hopefully this conference and some of the other tools that we're building can really help foster that connection between people in the gardens. Um, one of the ways uh, that we're trying to connect folks um, is through the map. So we do have a um, ABQ schools and community gardens map. Um, and I invite you to go and kind of check it out later online. This is the link bit.ly slash ABQ gardens. I don't know if someone wants to drop that in the chat but um, 
it's really fun to get on there and just kind of search for different gardens split by four APS zones. Um, but then uh, there's also other like small growing operations across um, across town. So we've got small local farms as well as community gardens. These little teal dots are all community gardens. Um, and then if you click on a, a garden site, you'll be able to pull up the garden contact and contact them. Um, and then you'll also be able to maybe scroll through some pictures of the garden site. Um, if you don't see yourself on the map, please do add yourself to the map. Um, I'll put that link in the chat when I'm done. Um, and you can send me your pictures and I'll upload them on there. Um, by no means is this a comprehensive map. You know, we say there's 93 school gardens, but there may be more, you know, I'm one person uh, across the district. So um, uh, by no means want to leave anybody out here um, and really just want to use this as a tool for people to connect um, and to kind of celebrate their garden spaces. It's a really powerful visual. Um, so we've got Kirtland Elementary School. I'm just gonna kind of start scrolling through some pictures we have here. Um, this is one of the very first gardens in APS. Um, this is a picture of Travis McKenzie and um, my supervisor, uh, Daphne Streeter. We've got Tony Watkins in the background there. Um, and this is the first uh, orchard planting at Kirtland. Um, then we got Hawthorne Elementary. I'm gonna kind of take you through all of the elementary schools first because we have gardens all across K through 12. Um, so Hawthorne Elementary um, is actually one of our food core sites this year. So um, APS partners with food core to have a service member in um, uh, different two different school sites uh, during the year. And this year we have Muddy Samora, my friend and ally and a beautiful human. Definitely recommend you get to know her and talk to her. Um, she has some amazing plant wisdom to share. Um, uh, and she's working over there at Hawthorne with uh, Miss Lynn Schuler, who's the teacher over there. Uh, they have a really simple uh, cinder block garden. Great way to just kind of get started. Um, uh, and Lynn did a cool little painting project with the garden here um, where all the students painted their own block and then they assembled the garden. So. We got Lou Wallace Elementary School. We've got um, uh, Mr. Granger over there at uh, Lou Wallace. And this is a picture of Charlotte Blair, who was our food core member last year. And then we got Del Norte High School and Governor Bent Elementary School. Um, this is a really great example of that intergenerational learning. Um, these schools paired up to do some um, uh, learning together in the garden and planting. Um, and you could use the map to form those connections too with different schools in your area. Um, this teacher at uh, Governor Bent, Ms. Carrie Kirkhoff, she um, is an amazing human who decided to grow a garden at her house and uh, during the pandemic and use it as a way to um, uh, teach her students remotely. So, um, you know, all these beautiful ideas that teachers come to the table with. Um, uh, and show, to show resilience in these times. Um, another example of that is all the fresh produce that went out uh, across the district during the pandemic. Um, this is actually through a partnership with um, a local farm, Cornelio Candelaria Organics um, and Southwest Organizing Project um, and the International District Healthy Communities Coalition. They sent out all these beautiful CSAs this summer to families um, at Whittier Elementary School. Um, and then we also had some seed kits going out. Uh, uh, we had all, over 200 seed kits go out from Mountain View Elementary School um, uh, with Miss Candace Stanford, the art teacher there. Um, and we've got Painted Sky Elementary School and Miss Kinsade. Got Van Buren Middle School. These are Travis's students back in the day, um, looking so happy with their fresh veg. And this is um, the Sandra Almond Garden at Van Buren Middle School. And then we've got the Bucket Brigade. Um, so we sent out uh, around like 200 buckets this summer um, uh, with uh, little five gallon yeah, bucket gardens that uh, families were growing at home. Uh, we've got some tomatoes. I think we planted quelites in here. 
um, more fresh produce going out at Wilson Middle School. So, um, you know, it's really easy to get the, the really little ones in the garden. Uh, that's kind of a no brainer. Um, but we also have like moving up to the middle school level, um, some garden electives um, across the district. So we have a garden elective at Wilson Middle School um, as well as Polk Middle School. And we're, we're wanting more, you know, um, we need to invest in our older students in the garden. Um, I go and work at Wilson, uh, uh, just, I don't know, every other week. And it's just so rewarding to be with the older students um, to in, it's kind of like a hard time in life, you know, middle school. So um, to see them out there working with the shovel and um, uh, just working through things is, is just really amazing. So really, wa really want to support the older students um, in getting into garden learning um, all the way up to the high school level. Here we've got some uh, student internships across the district. So we have um, uh, the New Mexico 2050 internship program at Rio Grande High School. Um, and then we also have uh, SWAP internships with uh, Donaldo Yanez internship. Um, and they work at Project Feed the Hood. They made an awesome video last year um, about COVID safe practices, um, led the way totally, wrote the script. Um, super awesome. So not only is it like opening a way for um, students to like maybe think about some career pathways, being a farmer, you know, being a chef, of course, all the things we think of soil scientists. But what I hear from students is that like, it really just opens them up to a whole new world of like what they can imagine for themselves as people. And that's don't, you know, that's what we want in our school is like, we want students to feel empowered, you know, to like dream for themselves and um, imagine happiness and, uh, and an awesome life. So uh, yeah, so I think Sorry to power through that. I don't know if I had got through it all fast enough, but um, we are going to talk. Oh, before I do that, three resources I wanna lift up for you. So we have one, uh, the APS website. I really try to keep this updated. Um, definitely recommend going over here to this little button, the upcoming events. Um, I update that with different um, community events that are going on, on that are related to garden learning great opportunity for teachers to be um, engaging in professional development for themselves, um, uh, as well as like all the other resources we have on, on the website, you'll learn about um, just like different lesson plans and, and stuff like that. Um, we also have the newsletter, which is a huge place of information dissemination. Um, I definitely recommend signing up for that. And if you drop your email in the chat, um, if you don't receive the newsletter already, I'll grab it from the chat and add you to the list right now. Um, mostly this is like garden highlights as well as um, uh, upcoming grants, um, upcoming workshops, uh, just little monthly planting tips and stuff like that. And then the third resource I wanna share is the School Garden Resource Binder. So this is something that came out of last year's conference um, and it's a just really, um, approachable tool to just like search for different, um, not only like lesson plans, but like videos for your class. There's also like different mentors you can um, invite to your class. And I'm not gonna go too much into that because Brittany's actually gonna give a tour of it or um, if we've gone, have I gone over my time yet? No, I think I have four more minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, so Brittany's going to give a little tour of all the awesome stuff on the School Garden Resource Binder. Um, and that's it. So uh, moving into our 10 minute break or breakout. So please do feel free to kind of get up and stretch your legs at this time and move around or get a drink. But also, um, I think we we're going to watch the video, the video first and then. Oh, sorry about that. Is that OK? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Uh, do you have that video? Can you send me the link or, or I, do you want? I do have the video if you would like me to go ahead and share it or uh, yes. I can definitely just go ahead and do just the walkthrough. I'd, I'm open for either one. Whatever you want to do, Brittany. Okay. I think Ask timeline timeline wise, I had it scheduled for the video. Okay, perfect. Then we will pop on into that. Yay. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yep. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so I just press play.
Hi, everyone, and welcome to the APS School Gardens Conference, the virtual series. We're certainly excited to have everybody be a part of this year's conference, and we look forward to hopefully getting to see everybody in person in the future. Now, if you're looking for any sort of resource, whether it is a quick lesson, maybe some activities connected to school gardens, or maybe you're wanting to dive a little deeper into the STEM, maybe some curriculum, and then focus on school gardens, boy, have we got the resource opportunity for you guys, especially for the fact that a lot of these resources are New Mexico uh, centered resources. We do have some that are gauged uh, towards the national as well as some international resources to tab into. Uh, but we'll go ahead and get started with showing showing you what the Live Finder has to offer. Now, this is a tool that is free for you all to utilize at your convenience. There are plenty of tabs to go ahead and look around and explore in. Uh, but we definitely want you all to have that opportunity to really dive into it and go ahead and see what works best for you in your garden with your students. Well, my name is Brittany Lardner and I am the program coordinator for New Mexico Ag in the Classroom. I am joined with Nisa Patterson, who works with the um, New Mexico State University's Extension Office here in Bernalillo County, as well as the APS Garden Specialist, Kateri Saba, the three of us have worked together to go ahead and combine these resources into one location so it's easy access for everybody to utilize these resources at your convenience. And so we'll go ahead and get started. I'll show you a couple of quick tabs, but then I'll allow you all to enjoy and explore and really just have a great time with, with it. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to Kateri or myself or Nisa, we'll go ahead and leave our contact info at the end of this video. It'll be on a slide on its own, okay? Um, but in going with these resources here, this is the very first page, the table of contents here, and it showcases you everything that is within the New Mexico Teaching Resources tab here. So you can see that the both of them line up there, and these are all the resources that we have to offer that are connected to New Mexico content and curriculum, activities, different resources all throughout the state. If we're gonna click on one, let's click on the APS School Gardens, just to go ahead and showcase to you guys what all you have access to. This should look fairly familiar if you are connected with the Albuquerque Public School System for the School Gardens connection. And so you can just see how, how we're easily able to connect these resources into all of these tabs. If we want to go to places to visit in ABQ, we'll click onto that button. There's a couple of different really neat options here that you guys can enjoy and learn more about. Um, so I'll let you all do the, the clicking and searching for more uh, focused opportunities there. If we're wanting to dive into the STEM or the STEAM, focus of our curriculum. We have a couple of different tabs that you guys can focus on there, as well as some guided lesson plans that are focused on third through seventh grade, as well as fourth through eighth. We wanted to make sure you all had some good resources to go off of here. And these curriculum resources uh, were developed to engage students K through 12 in their learning journey through agriculture and the garden, uh, gardening adventures. Also, visit the tab National Teaching Resources, then Curriculum for high quality, but not New Mexico based curricula, so, which is right up here. So I'm kind of circling it with my mouse right now. That is the section that it's referring to, just so that way you'll have something to connect based off of the curriculum here for New Mexico, based that with the national uh, teaching resources. But you can see here we've got a handful of different opportunities. Some are elementary based, some are middle school. And the upper section here is kind of just all throughout. So um, some of the curriculum does spread throughout the K through 12 section. So um, hopefully you'll be able to find something that works best for you. Um, some of the other tabs here, we've got land, water, and people. We've got a few of these tabs here down towards the bottom, New Mexico Ag in the Classroom. That's a program that I'm connected to. And we'll do a quick little tab onto that. Uh, but this is our curriculum matrix. This is where we house um, a 
variety of lessons that are not even just New Mexico based, but also nationally based as well, since we are in connection with the National Ag in the Classroom uh, organization. And so right here, you'll be able to find a ton of lessons as well. If you just do a couple of quick searches, if we just type in the word seeds, you will see that we pop up over 31 lessons that will be connected to seeds. So this is a great resource opportunity here as well as companion resources. And these resources here, as far as these lessons, they are connected to Common Core Standards. And so it's just a great way to go ahead and infuse them straight into your lesson planning process. And some of the other tabs here that we can focus on, there are videos for New Mexico agriculture and gardening. Nisa did a wonderful job of connecting these resources and we were able to even connect in um, some of the local connections here as far as the NMSU Bernalillo County Extension videos on how to go ahead and make some low cost hoop houses as well as uh, your soil care for the winter time. If we hop on over to the National Teaching Resources section, you'll see that there are again a number of tabs that are available within this section. We've got lesson plans, our curriculum, like we'll go ahead and connect in with the New Mexico Teaching Resources curriculum. You can see we've got all grades. We've even got preschool within this section, and elementary school. We have tons and tons of resources, especially connecting math into the garden. That's a big one right there. And middle school stuff here, edible schoolyard just some fantastic resources you guys so come and take a look nisa and i and kateri have had a good time making sure that this resource is set up for you all for anything and everything that you guys might be looking for when it comes to your garden and having students know where their food comes from and how it's grown so um we'll just invite you all to go ahead and take a look each of these tabs offer something different and new even professional development for for you um, specifically as a teacher or a leader, you know, we want you all to be prepared as possible and feeling confident in the curriculum and the, and the program resources that you have to offer. And so here are a couple of great opportunities. Uh, Edible Schoolyard, they offer different trainings for educators and gardeners. Uh, New Mexico Ag in the Classroom, the program that I'm associated with, we do offer professional development for teachers. Um, we can do specific site training, as well as just making sure that you feel confident in being able to provide that agricultural education to your students. So um, with that, just kind of wrapping up, this is a, a great resource for you to go ahead and take a look and explore within learn more about those gardening opportunities and really just having that availability of knowing what is here within New Mexico to explore, especially in all of our gardening needs. We look forward to having you all join us here on our live binder and let us know if you all have any questions or if you know of any good resources that might not be on here and you would like to share them with us. Well, yeah, obviously this is just a good place for us to go ahead and learn and share together. And so we look forward to that uh, collaboration with you as educators. So we hope that you guys have a great rest of your time at the conference and hope that you and your students are able to grow and thrive together, even if it is for the virtual aspect. Have a great day. I had a quick question. Thank you for sharing that. Um, of course. What would be the easiest way for a teacher like that found a great resource? Just would you recommend that they send that to you, Kateri, Anissa, and, and Brittany, and just say, hey, we have a resource for you guys to add? Is that the best way to do it? I think so. Yes. Any any of us three, I think, would be a great opportunity. So I can definitely leave um, our contact info down in the comment section. But this video is accessible on Uva, um, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, on our, on the uh, kind of um, apps page there where it showcases different videos. And so if they need to locate it, it's there, but I'll even leave it down in the comment section. So, yeah. Does anybody have any questions regarding the video? I know that that was kind of a lot um, quick and heavy there, but essentially there's a number of tabs, different subjects. You can go and explore and have some fun, but, uh, 
like Randy went ahead and asked real quick, uh, you guys can go ahead and share with us any additional resources or ideas that you would like to share that may not be on there currently. Okay. Yeah. Actually, great leeway, Brittany. Thank you mm -hmm. for that. Um, we're going to go into uh, a little resource building together. So I'm going to put a link in the chat. If you do have access to a computer right now, I invite you to open that link. Um, yes, Nancy, I will put the link for the binder in the chat again, as well as the website. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe we could just follow up with this group afterwards with some quick resources. We'll email out um, those those links as well as um, all of our emails um, so that y'all can have access to that. But for now, I invite you to open up that doc. And what we're gonna do is build a resource sheet together. So um, I invite you to add your favorite, um, your favorite school garden resource um, or gardening resource to this list. And I'll kind of try to shout them out as they get added. Oh yeah, Tejeras Transfer Station has free mulch. Definitely a huge resource. Um, I think they'll fill up the truck, your truck for 10 bucks, but if you bring a shovel, you can do it yourself and get some free mulch. Uh, we've got NMSU Bernalillo County Extension free seeds from NISA. Yep, so you can email your seed list to Nisa and she will um, send the seeds right to your school. It's pretty easy. Yes, MNO will deliver um, soil to your school. So APS has a partnership with the Water Utility Authority and um, essentially you will just, um, uh, you know, send a work order to um, heavy equipment and they will, um, uh, they will send or deliver the mulch to your school. I'm trying to find, we have a soil and mulch guide. Um, if you click on garden resources on the website, you can just kind of scroll down um, and find uh, the Albuquerque soil and mulch resource. And if you click on that, um, it'll download this document. Um, and when you open it, uh, you'll be able to see exactly how to figure out that process of getting um, uh, soil delivered to your school. Um, let's go back to that page. What else we got? So we've got Plants of the Southwest will give you struggling plants to save. Awesome. Definitely recommend you just hit up all the nurseries at that time of year, um, just see if they have anything left over. They're always down to support school gardens. Um, they donated a lot to this conference. So Plants of the Southwest, we've got Osuna, News, Osuna Nursery, Reams. Um, what are the other nurseries in town? Can you guys shout them out? Uh, let's see, Southwest Organizing Project, SWAP, Mateo, um, offers technical support with school and community gardens. Um, Mateo will just kind of show up and give you uh, uh, some support looking at the site. Um, definitely a pro at the drip irrigation. Um, La Placita Institute offers gardens and workshops for young people. Um, we got Alameda Greenhouse, Agricultura Network. We've got New Mexico Ag in the Classroom, can present in-person and virtual visits. Awesome. And I just want to offer up that, you know, like maybe you don't know any resources and like, you know, that's why we have the binder. And also it's a beautiful thing that you're here and you're, you know, just getting interested in it. I guarantee you show up to the garden and a lot of the students are going to be in the same spot as you are um and so it's a beautiful thing to model that for them and also they probably have a lot of knowledge to share with you so what a beautiful thing to kind of look to them um, for that guidance um all right cool so i'm going to share this out with the group um as well as uh the other three resources that i talked about the live binder the website and the map and from there, I can just pass it along to 
Um, Nisa, I think you're next. Kitir, do you want to um, share with me so I can, or is it in the? Sure. Do you want do you want me to send you the presentation, or do you want? To... I have the tab up, or do you just want to use? If we go ahead. Yeah, I'll just stop sharing and let. Oh, I will make you host. I think that's what. That way, because I have a few tabs open. So. Okay, so I am going to talk next. Let me get my presentation up. <clears throat> Are you shared with me? Yes, so you should okay. host now or co host. Okay, so. How do you get it in slideshow? Yeah. Slide. Do you know how you get it in slideshow, Kateri? Yes, so you will go to view and then present. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm so used to not used to using that program. Okay, so I'm Nisa and I'm gonna to talk to you about school garden design. Um, but before I, I do that, uh, so if you're, this is really, oops, do you guys see it? Okay, there we go. Sorry, uh, we can't see anything. You can't see anything? Not yet. Okay. This is that three little dots thing again, right? Okay. How do you do that again, Katira? Do you remember how I get my screen up? So if you go down to the bottom uh, yeah. inside of your screen, there should be a thing that says share screen. It should be right in the middle in green. You'll click on that and then it gives you an option of what screen there you want to share. There you go. Okay. Ready to go. You guys, I'm better in the garden than this. I really am. <laughs> we can see it now. You're good. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I've been having my hands in the dirt um, with school gardens since 2009. And I'd like to tell you just briefly how I got, it, got into that. I've been working with um, schools and kids in New Mexico for 21 years now. Um, I've been the state dropout prevention coordinator for PED. I've ran health clinics for kids in schools. I've ran mental health services for kids in schools, but I was working out in Tohajale, which is um, about half an hour west of town. This is in 2000. And I was running a mental health program for kids in the school. We had a trailer behind the school. It was a community school. So it was kindergarten through 12th grade, all in one school, serving Navajo community there. And we had a trailer behind the school and um, the kids would come there for mental health services and medical services. We had pediatrician, psychiatrist, therapists, all kinds of services, and it was really neat. They could just walk in anytime. If they had a sore throat, they could come in. Um, and then during lunch, we would just hang out with them. We would serve food. It's like a community center for kids. So at lunchtime, if they wanted to, they'd just come out and we'd be playing music and hanging out with the kids. And it was just kind of like a youth center, health center, mental health center. Well, there was this kid named Fred and Fred was just the neatest kid. He was always in trouble, you know, falling out of a pickup truck, breaking his back, not coming to school, you know, all the typical things that we say are trouble. One of the things I loved about Fred was he used to, he used to fling that trailer door open. I remember the wind out there until Hedgley was really strong. He'd fling that tra trailer door open and he'd put his hands up and he'd say, I'm here for my therapy. And, you know, most of the kids would come in real quiet, like they're for mental health services, like kind of ashamed, but Fred would fling that door open and he'd say, I'm here for therapy. And uh, he was never ashamed of coming to the therapist. He was kind of a, a kid who lived really out loud, but he didn't come to school much. And he didn't do, you know, traditionally quote well in school, you know, his grades weren't, weren't great and stuff like that. Um, and one spring break, the kid said, including him, a group of kids was there and they said to us before spring break, they said, hey, we're gonna be really bored over spring break. Are you guys gonna be here? So we said, sure, we can be here over spring break. What should we do? And the kids started brainstorming and they said, let's put in a garden. And so me and my colleagues looked at each other and said, sure, 
we could plan a garden over spring break right outside the trailer in the sand. Why not? Um, so we made a date. We said, okay, we'll be there on Tuesday or something. And we got there Tuesday at nine o'clock and there was a group of kids sitting on the trailer steps. And as we worked together that day, getting the garden going, you know, we have got soil, we got lumber, we were going to build raised beds, all that stuff. I learned from the kids that many of them had walked three, four miles that morning on spring break to come build a garden. And I just kept thinking as we were doing this work, like there's something really to this. There's something that really engaged these, you know, these young people to be here. And Fred was there, even though I never wanted to come to school, he came to build the garden. And we had this amazing spring break building this garden and just talking and listening to music. And that was the beginning and that was 2000. And um, in 2009, when I had moved on from working out there, I was in Albuquerque and I got curious about what was going on in APS with school gardens. Um, and so I got together with a group of people uh, in APS and we just started talking to each other about um, what, what was going on with school gardens. And we had our first sort of school garden meeting. We just put a call out, hey, if you have a school garden, let's meet and have a potluck. And 30 people showed up and it's just sort of, my involvement, I'm not, I didn't start, start school gardens. School gardens have been going on forever. I also worked at East San Jose Elementary School running a, a clinic there. And um, there had been a, a garden at East San Jose Elementary School since 1980. Um, Mr. Witherspoon, an older retired gentleman, used to come work in that garden. Gardening has been going on a long time, but some of us have just been coming in at different places. But I just, I just want to credit Fred who, who really taught me that, you know, for some students who are not traditionally engaged in school, um, a garden can be a really amazing way to engage them and to get them excited about coming to school. And so that was sort of how I really got involved in school gardening. Um, but for many of us, you know, whether I'm sitting in that trailer out in Tohajali, which literally had sand all around it, um, or you're in a school like Bandelier years ago here, um, Many of us want to start a school garden and we get sort of like an, an environment like this, you know, like somebody will go to their principal and say, hey, I want to start a school garden. And the principal will say, yeah, over in that corner will be great. And this is the kind of corner you often get. This was Mary Irwin years ago. Mary Irwin, though, is tough. So she walked up to this corner that the principal said, yeah, you can put the school garden over there. And she looked at it and that was it. And Mary said, OK, fine. That's where we'll put the school garden. And so Mary wrote a grant. Um, she got some legislative money, actually. She got, as I believe I have this accurate, she got $20,000 of a legislative money. Um, your state legislators all have money that they can use in their district. And she talked to the legislator and um, they have discretionary funds. And she got some of those funds and took this area um, and made it into this. Uh, the problem with this area, and one of the reasons she had to put, they had to put so much money into it is it was a drainage area for the school. So it was like a low point where they had to really remediate and deal with the fact that water was gonna collect there. So Mary went from that to this with determination and some funds. You can see the seating that she put in, you can see the raised beds. Um, she had a shed, uh, you know, she did what she could do with this spot. And, and so the most important thing I'd like you to come away with in terms of design for school gardens is really do what you can do um, with the area you're given. And sometimes that's, $20,000 worth, and sometimes that's really going to be low tech and low funds. And so we're going to look at the broad range of um, ways that you can take a, a piece of land and transform it into a school garden. It's also really important to think about, you know, what do you want out of this space? Mary was really, it was really important to her to do really a lot of instruction out there. Um, and so I like that she had the, the, the seating out there where she could bring her students out, have them sit down, talk to them. Um, and then she would take small groups of students and, and break them up and have them do different activities in different areas of the garden. So what you want to do out there is really important. Um, so I'm going to talk about sort of four areas that I think you, you might want to consider when you're designing, which is, you know, designing school gardens for exploring, because what kids want to do really is walk around and run around and touch and feel and dig. You know, they want to get their bodies moving out there. That's what they want. They want to be digging around. They want to dig around in those tomato plants and look for the bugs. Um, then there's the teaching and learning part, which as teachers or instructors, we, you know, we want to, we want them to be learning something out there. So what, what facilitates that? What kind of design facilitates teaching and learning? 
Then there's the plants. Plants have needs. And then there's, there's this whole idea of a garden as a community space. This picture you're looking at is um, the Edible Schoolyard in Berkeley, which is one of the iconic gardens. And one of the reasons I like this picture is I just get a feeling when I'm looking at this, you know, that invited, draw you in feeling. I personally just want to go run down that tunnel. I don't know about you guys, but I personally just want to get out there. And so I think part of what our gardens need to do is have that inviting feeling. Um, so there's lots of purposes to a garden, and I'm wondering if um, anybody here would be willing to just say any other purpose you can see for a garden. Um, actually, I work best if you just unmute and say it, but because you know finding that chat's challenging for me. Um, but I'm down to jump in. Huh? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think all these are great and there's so many purposes. Um, and one thing we can rally behind, I think across the district is the purpose is education. Yeah. You know, whatever that is, if it's a sculpture garden, oh. if it's a zero scape garden, if it's a food production garden, a pollinator garden. Um, and I think a big one is uh, building a relationship with mother earth, like mm -hmm. getting our students outside and connecting with life, with bugs, with dirt, with plants and, um, teaching us like nurturing, you know, and compassion and care. Um, there's so many analogies you can use with the students as you're working in the garden, um, but that, that connection, you know, that they have with creation or with mother earth or mother nature, whatever you want to call it. I feel like it's so needed, especially as we're all dealing with the pandemic and kind of stuck in these yeah. virtual worlds, you know, and sometimes our students are stuck in the classroom and, um, you know, getting them outside. There's just so much healing benefits. So, you know, education and building a relationship with Mother Earth, I think are huge. And thank you, Nisa, this is great. Mm -hmm. Those are, yeah, those are, those are, I mean, of course, I, I think the, the education piece for teachers is the grounding. And then there's all these other things. And I'd like to touch on this idea of relationship. There's so many different relationships. There's a relationship between the young people on the earth, there's young relationships between the young people themselves with the adults. Um, I remember Whitney Raish, who was a, um, a counselor, a social worker at the BIP program at um, Roosevelt, when a, she had a lot of kids who were in foster care and in her program there, and she used the, she used the garden. When a child would be moving from one foster family to another foster family, she would take them out in the garden and she would bring in a plant and she would say, you're this plant. And now you're moving from where you are to a new place. And they would plant that place in the soil, that plant in the soil. And she would say, you're still who you are. You're just moving your location. And I just thought, you know, that beautiful idea of how we can use the garden as a place of connection and meaning. Um, she, she, I just want to honor her work years ago. She did such beautiful work in the garden with um, that whole idea of connection. Uh, and so thank you, Trivies, for bringing that up because I didn't have that here. I think most importantly, ask the kids too. We, we sometimes forge ahead with our school garden planning and we get our team of teachers together and we get our team together at the school and we start planning the school garden or we do it one teacher or two teachers. But ask the kids. I, I once went to one of the schools out on the, um, out in Rio Rancho and I can't remember which one, a middle school. And I, they wanted to put a garden in. And I always like to start with the kids. I just give them a blank slate of paper and I say, take 10 minutes and design your dream garden. And I'm very purposeful not to give them a lot of ideas. And you would be surprised how many kids want roses in their garden. After years and years of doing this with kids, so many kids say roses. And I just feel like, I remember that particular class I did it with, I couldn't believe it was like 90% of the kids had written roses as one element of their dream garden. They all had so many different things. But because they all had, almost all of them had said roses, I think it's really important as adults to honor that and to make sure that, you know, hey, so many of you said roses and a bunch of them said they wanted like a, an arch to sit under. And um, so I think it's really important for them to see their own design ideas in the garden too. Okay, so this is um, John Adams. They had a little farmer's market at the school. And so when there was drop off or pick up at the end of the day, they had a table and they would sell to the um, they would sell to the families. And so just in terms of design, it was really important at that school to be producing a lot of vegetables. And then they, they would use the money from what they sold to reinvest in the garden. They also put, ended up putting in a very large orchard there. 
So, you know, just there's so many ways you can think about what design elements you're going to need. But um, in terms of the learning part, I really think we need to think about what structures we might need for learning. So work tables can be really important. Um, learning places. An outdoor kitchen can be important if you're you know, preparing or harvesting food. Um, a shed, of course, especially if teachers don't want to all be hauling stuff back and forth and a shed can be really nice. A place to gather comfortably as community, and that can be some shade or lots of seating. But um, I'm going to talk a lot about today about a lot of staging areas, which is, you know, different areas in the garden that you can say, okay, you five kids go over there, and you three kids go over there, and you two go over there, different, and then you can rotate them. I've, I've as I've been doing this a long time, I've come to see that as a really important um, teaching and learning strategy to really have areas of the garden that the, that the kids can be moving through. And thinking about, you know, our wind and our sun, how do we make it comfortable to be out there? But to be honest, kids, they really just want to, like, you. when you watch children, especially young children, but also teenagers and squirrely middle schools, middle, middle schoolers who I love, they want to get their bodies kind of down close to the, the ground. Uh, developmentally, that's really important. Actually, kinesthetically, it's really important to get your hands and your body moving. And we have a lot of kids who have balance problem these, problems these days and who have all kinds of um, eye ear coordination problems. And it has to do with them not actually moving their bodies enough. You know, there's so much screen time that a lot of occupational therapists these days will tell you they're not like, they're not like, you know, on swings enough and they're not down on their belly enough. And these things are really important for growing bodies. And they're actually what children want to do. So I would really say, make sure your garden has some space for children to move their bodies the way they want to build things, dig things, because this is basically, you know, a big mud pit with young children, you know, that's like their joy. That's just their complete joy. This is the mountain mahogany years ago. Okay, so when you design, let's think about that developmental need of children to, um, to, to really move their bodies and to wander. Uh, when you look at a garden, adults tend to design it very um, linearly you know, raise the beds all in a row. I, but children don't move their bodies like that. Um, and so at Kirtland, when we outlined Kirtland and put it in, we tried to make it more wandery um, to meet the developmental needs of children because they want to find nooks, you know, and that's really great for journaling and such. You can say, you know, you guys go over there and everybody find their little spot in the garden. Well, if you're telling children to go off and journal, it's really nice if they can find the little nooks and crannies in the garden and not just be caught between a bunch of uh, raised beds in a row. Um, that one down there, the nice yellow house, that's my, my new, new backyard, but I'm a big wander kind of gal in my own yard because I just, I just want to get lost out there. And I think that that's actually a pretty normal human um, desire to wander and, and explore in a garden. This is Sandia High School, which if you haven't been there, go as soon as you can. Um, they have a wetlands at their science building and it's just incredible. Right outside the science building is a, is a real wetlands and it just draws you in. Hopefully someday we can go back to field trips and this would be a great place to take students. This is the edible schoolyard in, in Berkeley. And again, I just want to show you because it has that feel, right? Just like that draw you in wandery feel. Uh, however, you could say, okay, that's Berkeley. And, you know, that look at all the land they have. But if you look up edible schoolyards, um, New York City, they have uh, edible schoolyards in uh, New York City. And it has a similar design. It's very wandery. So children, this is what children want to be doing. And um, what we often do is is this right and I, i'm not here to like criticize because the children love this garden at east san jose this uh these raised beds were paid for by um ethicon which is a corporation up the hill from them so that's the other thing i'd like to say is look for a local business they'll often you know give you supplies so ethicon i think they're um, paid for these and then the staff came and built these raised beds and look it's beautiful right and it's a beautiful area it's just it's very linear right and that's one way to do it. It, it can make gardening very um, sort of tidy and it can make it easy to say, you know, you kids go to that bed and you kids go over to this bed. But I often wonder if we could add a little bit more exploration and wandering into this space. However, <laughs> the, when, the, when those beds were empty, 
I know for a fact that the kids were just in there digging in the mud and having a great time. So kids will make fun out of anything. So this is what I mean by could you could you put some design elements in that are just really fun? You know, there's the those flowers in the um, there. That's an outdoor loom where you string up some strings and you invite the kids to put flowers or twigs or whatever and weave it through that and just make this beautiful um, place. I like the one with the sort of tent tent looking structure because it's also shade. But boy, kids would love to be under there doing their journaling. Now here's the ultimate truth. And this is the deep thought I'm gonna leave you with. Kids don't care. And they're perfectly happy with this beautifulness, which is just wildness. This is Sandia um, prep. And it's just amazing. It's just wild and good, great. That's the perfect design, if you ask me. We don't have to be overly worried about the design of a garden because anything will invite the inquiry of a, of a child. Um, and, and this is really representing, I think in lots of ways, the way mother nature presents herself, which is just this intermingling of all of it together. As long as you can supply the water and take care of it, I think that um, it can be really inviting to have just kind of a wild inter intermixed planting. However, this is what you might get if you ask a, as we did at Grant's, um, at actually uh, Grant Middle School, we ask a landscape design class at UNM to help us design the garden there. And this is what the, one of the students came up with. And I think it's fine. Um, it required a lot of infrastructure, uh, the bricks and everything. And I'm not sure it was completely child friendly, but it was really fun to work with the landscape design students to see what they thought of as, as a kid's garden. And this is the reality of many a garden in, this, in the schools. And I'm also here to say this is just fine because there's actually a lot you could do here. You know, tell the kids to go out and say, okay, those plants, those plants are struggling. Let's figure out why, you know? Let's see if we can get in there. Is it, is it water? Is there bugs? You know, why are they so short and scraggly? Let's, let's do a little science discovery to figure out why these plants are struggling. I, I feel very, um, as a person who's been gardening with kids for a long time, very accepting about all gardens, um, that you just make it work. And many gardens look small and kind of scraggly to the outside eye. And I really think that that's okay. It's really important, I think, for if you, if you want to do uh, effective instruction outside in the school garden, that you have seating that, that benefits instruction. You know, um, kids who are uncomfortable or can't find a place to comfortably put their body are sometimes not able to focus. So whatever seating you need to do that makes your teaching, you know, okay, guys, sit down for five minutes. I'm gonna tell you how, you know, the cycle of a butterfly. Of course, kids wanna be moving around, but there's times as teachers, we want them to all be sitting and listening. And so setting up your, setting up your seating, this um, one on the left is Inez or the one with the little individual seats. And I really high, highly recommend individual seating right now during COVID. Those bench seats would be a little harder to keep the kids have some space. And you can often get the tree companies to give you those um, stumps like that. I was at uh, Mount Mahogany yesterday and this is their garden there. And can anybody speak up and tell me how this might be hard to manage this seating during COVID and what you could do about it? You know, how would you rearrange this seating to be a little more COVID friendly? Because the kids are going to just go into that garden and pile all next to each other. What would you do? I mean, if nobody else wants to jump in, I would probably pull that out and get some like single seats in there maybe. Um, I don't know if there's like another spot in the garden where we could put this, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. But maybe just like COVID renovation, you know, it's like, you're right. They'd just pile in, there'd be kids all over the place. So um, somehow like the individual seating, like you're saying, like either stumps or oftentimes schools have the foldable chairs or, you know, even those individual desks, not that I like them, but mm -hmm. they are good to kind of space out people. Um, but yeah, work with what you got, you know, and even like buckets, if they were sitting on buckets, you know, or something where you could do a formation of individual seating, but 
I uh, totally agree with you, Travis. I would probably put those out somewhere else, maybe use them as workbenches, but I would replace the seating for now to make it code friendly. It would reduce the teacher stress a lot, I think, to go out there and not have to be saying, okay, guys, stop, 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 but just to have the seating ready to be spaced apart. Um, this kind of invites a little bit of stress. Well, the only other thing I could see together. Again? I said getting rid of the table altogether. It just uh, seems to be taking up so much space and I don't know what they're using it for, but they may not need it. Because I could see moving the table and the benches and then putting some like individual logs there and you'd, be, you'd probably be able to fit with the three foot spacing, you know, 10, 15 kids. It's actually quite a big deck and then there's a blackboard there. So yeah, just really think about, and then maybe the table could be moved out to an area where you have a project already ready on the table and you tell a few kids go over there and work on that project. And so you're using the table more like a project area. Um, Trevise, I'm gonna take a few more minutes here before we're up for you. I have a million pictures. We probably won't get through them all, but. You take as much time as you need, Nisa. Okay, so um, anyways, keep working on your seating. This is bandolier close, close up, but you see how that, it went from there and then it went to the stone seating and then it was really hot with the stone seating. So then they got the money to put a, a flag over the top. So sometimes with seating, you have to just keep working on it until it's getting it comfortable. And um, so as a teacher, I also just want you guys to think about, or as an instructor of any kind, what do you need to teach? You know, what environment do you need um, as a teacher? And so I, when I teach in the garden, I actually like a place to write because I might want to draw if I'm teaching about the structures of a plant, I might want to show it, but I also might want to draw it so the whole class could see. So for myself, I like like some some you know whiteboard. I like that whiteboard with the um, that's covered there. I also like the big tables in these, so you could put out demonstration items or have young people working on a project there. Um, this is Coronado Elementary. I like white that whiteboard. Um, let's see. So let's talk a little bit about the staging areas. And this is where you have some places already ready for the kids. Um, and I think during COVID, this is also really nice. You know, you have an area, you can have like a weather station, like you three kids go, go, you know, document what's going on with the weather station, write down today's temperature and wind speed. Um, you four over, go over there and pot those, um, you know, take those small seedlings and put them in bigger pots. You four over there, why don't you go into the herb dry, drying area and pick some lemon balm and put it in the dryer. Now this doesn't, and, the, and you, you over there go sketch the, the tomato worm. If for right now, and I think it, it's often helpful in garden, but for right now it's really great to keep kids in those smaller groups. Um, and so let's look at what that might look like. So kids are perfectly happy to be, you know, food preparing like this. It's not obviously very COVID safe, but I don't have any COVID safe pictures right now. But then at Sandia High School, they put in an outdoor kitchen. Um, this is Sandia Prep, sorry. So you can do it on a deck like that, that's fine. You know, the kids are usually fine with it, but this helps you kind of like have a little bit more organization and a place to put the refuse. And they had um, just a family who owned a construction company come build this as a donation. You know, with harvesting, I think it's really good to have things like baskets already available. So you can just, again you're kind of ready when they come out like here you five grab a basket and go pick herbs to dry um have a, a an area for um potting and starting seeds kids always want to it's a really good teaching technique to have them drawing and documenting sketching um doing work you know this is where they were obviously doing something with the different herbs and um some sort of height or something like that. There's always work to be done. So it'd be really nice to have a staging area that's work that needs to be done. Like, okay, there's a there's a roll of plastic over there. You guys need to cut six feet of plastic to put over the, the beds for the winter. I, children like to do work and sometimes it needs more adult supervision, the tools, but you can maybe have somebody over there with them, but that could be a really good work sta a station is, is, the, is some work. For lots of young people, expressing yourself through art is really important. So, you know, an art project that's being worked on, signs, murals, any, any art, that's a good station. 
And here's another kind of weather station. But what I liked about that one was the scale. I think having a scale out in the garden is really great because you could say, okay, you guys go harvest the tomatoes, but you know, weigh them and we're going to keep a chart of, of the weights. And then let's just look at some tables. I think those ones with the buckets in them are really handy. You can wash vegetables, you can put specimens in. There's lots of outdoor sink plans in school gardens that can be really handy. You often just hook a hose up to them, but even rustic tables, work tables. Um, here's some other outdoor sinks. But I like that they have big countertops. And I want to show you this one here. I really like, and this is, I've actually seen a garden or two with this, is a long table like that along the wall. Maybe it'd be a little wider, but a long table like that can be really useful have for having young people spread out projects. Or, you know, some groups here and some groups down there. And of course, you need a place to kind of organize your, um, your work materials. Okay. So the last thing I'm going to talk about here is um, those 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 things we're talking about designing for you know teaching, having them tools you need to teach, your whiteboards, whatever you need, having a place to um, having tables that you can put your materials or young people's materials, and having projects going on the tables, and also having staging areas. But there's also this idea of what plants need. And I don't think you need to get too worried about this. And, and if you want help designing a garden for the plants needs, please contact us at County Extension. We, we work for the College of Agriculture. We're agriculture people, and we can really help with this. But one of the main, main principles is that um, plants in New Mexico need to be sort of protected, especially in the spring, from wind and um, sun and um, help keep water in. So our conditions can be a little harsh. So just think about. Um, Let's see. So this is this one here is Alameda and you can see those Alameda Elementary and you can see all those big raised beds. What I'd like to say about this is it's great and it's beautiful. Um, I did notice over there they have some um, shade cloth there shading some of the plants. You'll often need to do that in these big open gardens where the wind whips through. So if you can plant trees along the edge of your garden or any way that you can provide protection um, or some shade because some of these big open gardens um, in the spring, it can be kind of harsh if, uh, with the wind. And the way, one of the ways you can do that is provide some sort of trellising systems. You know, that kind of breaks the wind in the summer. It provides some shade. Also, it's fascinating to kids to see things growing like this. I did it in my own yard this year. I did a, these hoop trellises and I grew loofah sponges on them. And it's just so amazing to watch the, the, the the loofahs, which is a gourd, kind of hang down. That middle one is trombaccino squash, or an Italian squash, and they really will grow like that if you grow them from trellises. But trellises can be a really important way in New Mexico to kind of break the wind and provide shade and get that fun part in for kids. Um, we, the, we love raised beds. Um, I'm not sure if ever, well, maybe it's probably, I should never say, ever, you know, I shouldn't say 100%, but almost every school garden I've ever gone to, people, the first thing people talk to me about is raised beds. And um, I think raised beds are fine. I think the lumber, it can be expensive. I think that the upkeep of keeping that lumber from just cracking and breaking and leaking. A lot of times when you water raised beds, the water just kind of runs out the cracks between the lumber. Um, and they kind of break down quickly. So I'd like you to think about some more cost-effective edging for garden beds, which is like logs. This is um, the Lily Garcia Memorial Garden at Doranas that I helped put in. And that's my little, my little girl who's now 10. Um, but we just got logs from Baca's trees and mulch from Baca's trees. And here's another view of it a little bit later, we put in some trees, but you can see, I mean, it's such a cheap, it costs nothing. We've got soil solution soil, but the logs cost nothing. And they essentially act like raised beds, but they don't break down in this way that, and they're not as expensive as lumber. You can also do, um, somebody just used, uh, that's Hoover, used concrete. Um, use what you have. You can use hay bales, straw bales, sorry, down there at Naka. And these are, uh, these are just ways that you can enclose the soil, but I want you to think about water leakage. I want you to think about how hot it gets. And I want you to think about saving funds. Uh, here's Kirtland 
with logs. I'm just a big proponent of logs. Here's Kirtland and the edging there. They had to put rocks, they had to put that fencing and then rocks all along it because they had so many beautiful friends, gophers and bunnies who wanted to come in and many, many years of, of trying to keep them out. And this was a solution. Um, let's see. So that last one was just that if you want to do a giant $100,000 greenhouse, Sandia High School has one, you know, not, not Sandia Prep, but Sandia High School. Uh, APS. It's an amazing greenhouse and plants love it, but it's quite an operation. Okay, so let's just quickly, this is kind of the last thing I'm going to show you here is um, this is Kirtland at the beginning. This is putting in the infrastructure, putting in the soil, putting in the mulch, you know, planning it all out. And this is um, what I'd like you to see in this picture is that way back there on that top picture there's a little tree do you see it it's a little round circle and in that round circle is a little tree well that tree is the same tree you see here over by those logs in the picture down below and this isn't that many years i would say this is about seven eight years between these two pictures and so the infrastructure and the planning that you're doing for a school garden you know can rapidly um evolve into a really beautiful space. Uh, but thinking about it and putting some effort on the front side can really be um, can really be valuable as you think about well, what do we want out of this space? And I look at, Kirt at Kirtland now and I think what a beautiful place to bring community together, to gather, to teach, um, to let children explore. But if it had been designed in a really linear sort of sterile way, it wouldn't have the same sort of um, appeal. So that's just something to be thinking about. Hey, Nisa, real quick, yeah. there was a question that asked, what kind of tree was that? Do you happen to know? Mm, looks like a cottonwood, doesn't it? Poplar or cottonwood? Do you know, Trevis? I would say cottonwood. Uh, if I remember correctly, that was a cottonwood, uh-huh. Okay. Which is amazing to see that growth. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and amazing in particular to, to see, um, yeah, I remember this day. Yeah, I was going, oh, Lord, have mercy. We got some, oh, I don't know, people. I don't know. But the principal was all on board, and, and years later, here it is. So um, I'm going to stop here, and I'm always available at County Extension to help you with design. But if you have any questions before Travis takes it and talks a little bit about their garden there and his work with gardens. Anything? Okay. Um, my last question to you is if you could put in the chat, please. What's one thing, okay, I went and talked to, so many kids have said they want roses. What, what's one thing you would really want in a garden? If you could just drop that in the chat. If you were designing, What's something you would put in it? Water feature, a stage. Thank you, Trevi. So an orno, fragrant plants, prickly pear, fruit trees, fountain. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Trevi, for mentioning a stage. I think they're very valuable. Uh, you can do plays, you can. You can teach from up there. You can do community events. We kind of forget you could have concerts, earthworks, berms, depressions. Yes. Um, using the contour of the land. If I had more time, if we were in design 102, I'd be talking about how we can use um, um, contours and hills and stuff to really keep water. A dye garden, flowers. Children really like flowers. I have noticed that over the years. There's just something so evocative about flowers. Now they like everything. Okay, Chavis, um, I remember you all those years ago at those beginning potlucks coming in so excited about school gardens and you've had quite your own school garden journey. journey so I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Miss Nisa. Virtual round of applause for 
Miss Nisa, she's one of my garden mentors and we've been in this uh, for a long time and it's so good to share space with her. I'm ready for design 102. I'll sign me up. I'm ready to get going. And I don't know if this PowerPoint is going to be available for people, but I would love to show this to our administration. Um, I think it really shows the diversity and the amazing um, spaces we can create um, under the umbrella of what a school garden is. Um, you know, I always, always taught my mentors, Miguel Santisteban, and he always taught me that agriculture is really arte, that it's an art form and that we get to paint um, through planting and through building and creating these spaces. And so you really did a great job at showing us that, you know, it's not all about uh, linear rows or um, even just so not even about growing food that so much goes into the garden space. Um, and so I just have a short time. I think Nisa really uh, knocked it out of the park with seeing different designs. So hopefully people um, joining us today are getting ideas on either how to um, add some of these things into our already existing school gardens, or if you're joining us and you're starting fresh, I mean, you got a really cool resource here to see like what you can do. Um, I'm going to give a quick little spiel and then I was going to try to walk you around my yard and just show you actual plants going on right now. And I'm going to show you a garden that I've developed doing virtual learning. So my kids were with me from the beginning picture to now I got a bunch of stuff going on um, if there's time. Um, but one thing I did want to emphasize uh, is really give some time to think about what you want to create. Um, I think it really does uh, benefit to the school and to the future generations of students for, oh, I'm spotlighted. I think I'm still going. Okay, now I'm spotlighted. Now it's all serious. Um, but I think it's really good to think through it and include as many people as you can in that design process, like Nisa was saying. Um, students, uh, families, uh, staff, teachers, neighbors, community members, um, organizations, and governmental agencies, and UNM, and CNM, and all this stuff, like the more partners, and the more voice you can get in the design process, I feel like the better, and the more the students in the community are involved in building it, I think you're going to be a lot better off, um, you know, we do deal with vandalism in gardens, um, we deal with what I call the one teacher wonder syndrome, where one teacher's passionate about a garden and if they leave the school for some reason, the garden seems to go with them. I've seen many gardens wilt away as somebody left and nobody's there to um, pick it up. There's also challenges with working with the administration and your principals. And so all these people are really good to get on board at the beginning. And Kateri and Randy's department, um, Coordinate health, coordinated health department, or we'll put some links in. They've done a really good job at trying to provide information on who we need to contact if we want to create a school garden or if we're uh, renovating or whatever. Um, so the more people you can get in the collaboration, I think there's strength in numbers. We're stronger together. Um, the more people you can have involved in designing your space, I think the better. Um, and really think through purpose. Why am I doing this school garden? Um, what are you going to do with the produce? Um, how are you going to teach a class out there? Um, all these kinds of questions that, you know, sometimes we forget, we just go for it, we start building, we start planting, and then we're like, well, wait a minute, what am I going to do with all this produce or, you know, um, thoughts after the fact. So um, I think those are some, some words of advice I wanted to give. Um, I've been working in school gardens for over a decade, um, I've been honored to go around and help start different school gardens or um, build capacity with different gardens. And, you know, I was thinking what I want to say in the short time I have, um, having a committee or some kind of garden group in your school is very beneficial. Um, I'm a big proponent of community schools. So if you are a community schools, you might already have a community school council meeting. And those are great places to have a space where you can talk about garden stuff. Um, sometimes it's a subcommittee of that council where the garden people meet and then they report back in that big meeting. You think about an instructional council, every school has an IC. And so you might want to connect with that group if you're not already a part of it to give a garden update or just to kind of make it more of a school-wide initiative. Um, the other thing is programming. You know, I mean, a lot of us here um, have been doing this for a long time. And I think we still have a long way to go 
I think Miss Susan's on from the Wildcat Garden at Wilson. Um, you know, I'm so honored to say that she's one of our only uh, garden elective teachers in the district right now at the middle school level. Um, I used to do one at Van Buren and I'm trying to recreate something at Polk. Um, but looking forward, I think, you know, we need to provide more opportunities for teachers and admin to learn how to do it within the school structure. And when I say that, how does it connect to a full-time position? Like, is it a teacher that teaches one subject, but maybe they can add in an elective class? Um, under the middle school level, I was teaching under the problem-solving elective umbrella. And so I was able to teach an actual garden elective through that. Um, and other schools are doing different things. Um, you know, at the elementary school level, I would love for it to be a pullout where just like kids get pulled out from art or music education, we could have garden education teachers. That I think happens at Coronado still, but I'm not familiar with many other elementary schools where it's an actual position, um, but really working with admin and, and now's really what we're, it's almost too late to think about the budget for next year and how it works. So you really have to be ahead of the game. You know, if you're thinking about building a position for a teacher or some kind of staff to, to support the garden, you want to think about it almost like a year ahead and kind of project on to the next year. I'm happy to report I'm a teacher at Polk Middle School and I have a very supportive admin, which is great because you don't always have an administration that supports what you want to do. My admin really wants to do outdoor learning. They want to build ornos. They want to create like as many garden and outdoor learning spaces as we can on our beautiful out, uh, campus in the South Valley. Um, but I just learned about a resource teacher position. And so the administration has proposed in the budget that I would actually be a garden resource teacher for the school, as well as teaching New Mexico history to seventh graders. And I think that is one of the best things that I just learned about this year. Um, again, like it's kind of a maze and a journey to figure out the bureaucracy and how the schools function, because I'm new to this. It's only my fourth year teaching. But I wanted to shout that out because potentially your schools might have that opportunity where um, you could do a resource teacher position. And if it gets approved and I do this next year, I would love to work with people and piloting it first next year and then seeing how maybe we get it in other schools. Um, you know, at the high school level, just wanted to shout out John Wright. He's just doing some amazing work uh, at the high school level. Got Bino at the CEC. I just learned in this garden conference that he has a curanderismo course where his students actually have a class where they learn about curanderismo. They grow herbal medicines and stuff in the greenhouse. Um, there's just amazing stuff. South Valley Academy comes to mind. They've had uh, awesome garden for a really long time. That was the first farm I actually went to back in 2006 and seven, the dragon farm. I don't know all the OGs in here. You might remember the dragon farm. Um, but anyways, I think what I'm saying is, you know, you got to be creative and it can be just a teacher doing it and going above and beyond. You know, I think we see that a lot where the teacher does all their content work and their teaching, but also does the garden. But I think if we can level up and build capacity where we actually have positions supporting this in schools, I think it's gonna take us into the future. And I would just like to thank all the amazing teachers that are out there stewarding school gardens um, because it looks great and it's really romanticized, but it also is a lot of work. Um, we're talking blood, sweat, and tears. If you've ever had a group of students, over 15 students in the garden, you know it's a lot to manage. And so um, really like what Nisa was saying and having different projects to delegate, that's really how I did it at Van Buren. Okay, this group's doing this, this group's doing that, this group's doing that. I got the crew of students that aren't gonna do anything. They're just gonna sit there and that's okay. You know, it's like, you gotta manage everybody. Um, and I'm really excited for community schools and home to school liaisons to get families in schools doing gardens. Um, if I could get this resource teacher position, I could do a garden workshop for families um, once a week or twice a week or get families in there. Um, just thinking about the possibilities together. So I did want to say that we obviously there's not enough time to uh, say everything, but I wanted to show you guys just the plant world real quick. Can you guys see my phone one? Should I turn the screen off on my. Kateri, could you spotlight my phone camera or does that not work i could also just turn my computer around actually yeah i can spotlight your phone i think your camera's not on on your phone though 
Oh, it says it's on. Actually, that's my computer where the camera's off. Oh, okay. I'll turn your phone. Your... I'll just do a quick little. Oh, here we go. I see him. Here we okay. go. I spotlighted him. It should work now. Okay. okay. Can you guys see it? Yes. All right. So this is just a quick little bucket. I'm in my front yard. So you can see my strawberries are blooming. So I'm very excited to be getting some strawberries in a week or two or a couple of weeks. Perennials are a great thing for gardens because they come back every year. And uh, this is my oregano, keeps my bowls of pozole stocked up all year round. Uh, and this is pretty curious. So I have this guy who I think might be some kind of milkweed or something. I got my kelites in here, which is a wild spinach. And on the bottom canopy, I have basil seeds coming. So this was a basil last year. Can you guys see it or is it freezing? There we go. Might be freezing. It's okay. Okay. Um, here's time. Let's see. Can you guys see the time on my computer? I can't. I could just see the old shot. No, it's frozen now. It's frozen. Well. Well, anyways, I wanted to show you a little bit more. Let me walk over here and see if it unfreezes for some reason. No. Oh, there we go. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. <laughs> oh, the complexities of Zoom and online. So this is a cool garden that my class has been a part of. So, so it was like the same thing, like just driveway status dirt and my class was with me as we put in the drip system. Now this is just a real easy main line and we got all kinds of cool stuff here. Garlic, lettuce. This lettuce actually overwintered, which is really cool. I planted it in like fall. It just chilled and now it's ready to harvest. So I'm trying to get into overwintering crops as a strategy. Um, garlic, we got sweet peas bumping. We got our spinach. And I just got more roots and all that stuff. But um, just wanted to show you some of that stuff so we could see the plant nations and live. I, I look forward to when we can do this again. Here's my, I call it my mojito bed, but it's just my spearmint over here. Um, so anyways, just all these good things. Kateri, I'm going to go ahead and shut my phone down and just be on my computer here. And um, Travisus is Nisa. We have, you know, we have this hard thing where they kick us out in five minutes. So I'm wondering if anybody has any um, questions or thoughts on the programming. I think I thought you made a lot of really good points about the programming and who to have involved. And yeah, let's do questions, whatever anybody needs. If anybody has some, I just wanted to, them to get answered. But. Absolutely. And Are you could just unmute, might be the easiest, or if you want to put it in the chat. I think maybe to kind of get it started, um, Travis, what would be some good kind of like pairings to do in the garden of like different either herbs or different veggies and fruits? Or how, how, how would you best kind of sort that out if you're starting your garden? Ooh, well, the first thought that came to mind was perennials versus annuals. So when you're establishing your garden, you can put in perennials where that'll just be the plant there for years to come, um, which is always awesome. And then like a strawberry bed comes to mind or an herb garden, um, things that are perennials. There's a lot of other ones. Um, and then your annual section is where you're going to be doing the, you know, more edible kind of like, I don't know, general crops and stuff like that. Um, but walkability is huge functionality. Like Nisa said, like, are you gonna be bringing a class of 30 students in your garden? Then before you build it, you wanna make sure that you, you know, cause I'm a, I was a farmer and a school gardener. So like on the farm, we can squeeze everything in cause we're trying to get as much as we can. But when I'm building school gardens, I really wanna double the spacing or even like, I love the exploring kind of shapes that Nisa was talking about where it's not just like straight rows but it's more of like walking around. And then I guess my other thing would be like a heart space. So like every garden, every good garden that I have been to has a spot where you can chill, 
has a spot where people gravitate towards where you do announcements for the day, or it could be the cottonwood tree like Nisa showed us. It could be a shade structure or an outdoor classroom kind of stage area. But having that gathering spot to get started is really good, you know, and if you don't have space for that, maybe thinking about huddling up before you go into the garden. So everybody kind of you've worked through what we're going to do and things like that. Um, and seating and shade, I think, is really critical. And art, just to beautify the space, you know, um, having the kids art hung up on the fence or creating murals on walls or on uh, plywood and stuff like that comes to mind. But I'll pass it over to my colleagues here. Yeah, really good point about the uh, seating. It's uh, it's one of the things I have seen the most is that we, we focus on the growing, which is great, and the raised beds, but we're going to put all those little wiggly bodies, you know, um, and getting children to children or even um, teenagers to sit as part of the day can be really settling as part of your time out in the garden. So you want to have places you can settle and then places you can move. And um, so it's kind of like that in Waldorf education, they call it breathe in, breathe out, but you need that movement, move all around, go do your work, but also where do you sit? Where do you listen? Where do you have a presentation? Where do you have a, um, it's, it is some of that heart space, that, that, that place where we sit and connect, and then that space where we move around. And so um, trying not to, try not to neglect one use for the other, but it doesn't have to be expensive seating. It can just be a bunch of logs or uh, logs around a cottonwood as far as I'm concerned is, is fine. And I love compost spaces. I don't know, I think compost it's- Compost spaces. A, yeah, I didn't mention that, be, but- mm -hmm. I think that's a cool one where you could put all the weeds and stuff you're doing, tool spot, things like that. Where I know we're short, we're gonna run out of time. I didn't know if there was any other I'm not seeing any in the chat. I did want to shout out the IDYC. I'm here with the International District Youth Coalition. They joined us. We got students at all the leadership high schools and they're learning about gardening and we're going to do another shop after this. So I'm going to have to leave. Won't be there at the 510 thing, but I wanted to shout them out and just leave everybody with, you know, hey, where is there not a garden that maybe we can create one? Um, thinking about edible landscapes can be applied to anywhere, any space. If it's a school, great. If it's a senior center, affordable housing, your backyard, your front yard. If you're in an apartment complex in your courtyard. I mean, just getting creative and seeing all the beautiful things we can create in terms of edible landscapes or just um, creating spaces that, you know, we want to be in and that we want to get lost in or heal up in or rest in. So thank you, everyone. It's been awesome. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Reach out to us. We're all here. <laughs> Kateri, Travis, me, anyone? I'm going to put my contact info in the chat if anybody wants to get a hold of me. Yeah, and shout out to the Wildcat Garden, Susan, and just there's some beautiful work going on in the city. And shout out to everybody who made this conference possible. We appreciate all your hard work and mm -hmm. the organizing team. Woo! <laughs>